Sunday school message. We're back in the parables. Did anybody guess that? <laughs> I have been known to throw a curveball every once in a while, but not today. Now, I had, had a really, um, really great time working on this message. You know, really, I tried something new. It took a different approach. And uh, so let's see how it all turns out. So today's lesson is on the amazing manifold mercies and graces of the Lord, our God, Jesus Christ, and the human response to them. So let's turn our hearts and our minds to the Lord by turning in the scriptures to the book of Psalms. That would be Psalms chapter 86, verses 12 through 13. So turning in your scriptures. Psalm 86, verses 12 and 13. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is the mercy, thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. I want us to draw our attention to the phrase, my God. This intimate and touching personalization of one's creator and maker appears 138 times across 33 books. Sorry, I'm a statistician at heart. From Genesis to Revelation. In Psalms, most frequently, 53 times, and here in Psalm 86, twice. But nowhere does the sentiment so thoroughly and lavishly lay open the sinner's heart, heart's imploration under the ever-crushing weight of indebtedness owed to one's God. Here, in David's preceding plea, we see in Psalms 86, 1 through 2, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. And what the Bible commentator Alexander McLaren calls a sheaf of arrows, out of a good man's quiver, shot into heaven. The remainder of this remarkable psalm crescendos into a subsequent vigorous and enthusiastic outpouring of gratitude and praise for forgiveness faithfully sought and finally received. And so it was with the woman that is the subject, that is the object lesson, lesson of today's parable. The creditor and the two debtors found only in Luke chapter 7, verses 41 through 43. But more on that later. Let's jump right into today's parable. Before we do that, we're going to take care to capture the also vital context. So we'll be starting out are reading and uh, beginning in Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. It's kind of long, but we got to get the whole context here. It's absolutely crucial. And one of the Pharisees desired him, that is being Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping. It began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with anointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. One owed 500 pence and the other owed 50. And when they had nothing to pay, 
He frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest this woman, I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil didst thou not anoint, but this woman anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to him to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. As always is the case in Scripture, we must take great care to put it into context, ensure we understand it within its historical and cultural framework. Our ever-present goal is to comprehend it as the author and finisher of our faith intended it to be understood. The parable eliciting our interest today takes place relatively early in the ministry of Christ, while in the beginning stages in Galilee. It was just in the perceiving chapter, Luke 6, where Christ gave his famous Sermon on the Mount, likely being delivered in Chorazin, a city on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. Christ retreated to Capernaum soon after, there healing the centurion's servant before traveling further south, arriving in Nain, just southeast of Nazareth, where he raised the widow's son. The first of three scriptures records Jesus raising the dead. But both events are chronicled earlier in chapter 7, the very same as our parable. At this point, Christ likely may have circled and begun traveling north towards the east side of the Sea of Galilee and arriving at one of the cities near Magdala. We are not told. Jesus arrived in town where a Jewish leader, either known as Simon the Pharisee, lived. Hearing that the recently famed prophet and healer that there had been so much excitement and discussion about had arrived in his jurisdiction, Simon desired that Jesus would come and eat with him. Quite remarkably, Christ, knowing the man and his devices, went straight away, entering his house, setting down to dine with Simon and his entourage, proving what he had said earlier in Luke 7, 34 and 35. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified by all her children. Christ is affirming that he, in fact, came and lived what is essentially an ordinary, everyday life in deep contrast to that of John the Baptist. Given that John's was a more austere manner of ministry, their messages were the same. It foiled the motives of the Pharisees who rejected John's rigid lifestyle of self-denial, while at the same time, they expected Jesus' life to exhibit similar characteristics. But instead, Jesus came and freely associated with men, all manner of persons in need of salvation. Given this reversal in personal traits, it had to baffle Christ's enemies. And as we shall see, wisdom is vindicated by the results. Indeed, Simon, under the guise of respectability and affection, invited Jesus into his house, 
undoubtedly with the motive to defraud and ensnare the Savior in some way. We evidence this by the way Simon did not afford Jesus the courtesies and ceremonies calmly afforded guests in that day. From this, we might also observe that many men pay all due civility and respect to Jesus outwardly, but inside they possess no inward heart love and trust in Christ. Another point we need to understand in contrast to our times is that large dinners such as Simon's were open to the public. Ordinary people could come and go observing discussions among important town officials and dignitaries in that culture. In this setting, conceivably, Simon was inwardly hoping to defame and entrap Christ, his real motive to expose Jesus as a fraud in front of the crowd. But as we can readily see, as always the case, when one tries to make Christ the fool, the scheme backfires and quite the opposite occurs. Now, while Jesus is reclining at Simon's low-lying dinner table, as was customary in those times, on a couch on his side, with his feet pointed backward away from the table, that a woman of disrepute suddenly enters the scene. Her presence is noteworthy because 15 verses that make up this passage, all but three, directly or indirectly address her. Thus she enters history as an object lesson in the striking depiction of events in Christ's ministry. We know little, very little about this woman. We do not even know her name. We do know that she is called out a sinner. A careful reading of the original Greek word here indicates someone devoted to a lifestyle of sin. She was likely the town prostitute, further evidenced by Simon's knowledge of and contempt of her. We should take care not to confuse this event with another of Scripture. Matthew, Mark, and John all relate in a very similar scene with Mary of Bethany, the sister of Lazarus. However, this is a different location and much later in Jesus' ministry, indeed during Passion Week. Several parallels there. In fact, it might even been modeled after this. Likewise, there is no reason to confuse this woman with Mary Magdalene. Luke mentions Magdalene in the opening verses of the very next chapter. So some commentators have linked the two together. However, it would not make sense that having just made this woman the central figure of this earlier passage, he would not name her if she were, in fact, the very same Mary. Also, Mary Magdalene was accounted in Scripture as a woman of substance, indicating that she was of some wealth. The fact that Scripture names Mary after the city of Magdala, Magdala may also tell us that she was of some local status. Perhaps it was also, there were a lot of Marys in the Scriptures, and so they were trying to separate that way. Maybe it's a bit of truth of both. She probably had some status in, in Magdala. Finally, although Mary had suffered at the hands of demons, we have no reason to believe that her wealth and status came from prostitution, as that would be the case for the earlier woman mentioned. Scripture does not tell us how this unnamed woman came to hear of Christ or how she entered her present state. However, we can imagine these parallel events recorded in Matthew chapter 11 around the same period may have led to her being called to saving knowledge and faith in Jesus. Matthew records that even after the great works he did, you'll remember uh, the preaching of the greatest sermon ever preached in Chorazin, the healing of the centurion's servant in Capernaum, the raising of the dead's widow's son, that Christ pronounced woes on these cities and Bethesda, or Bethsaida, for not repenting and believing on him. He then follows that up with one of the most extraordinary invitations one could ever conceive in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, 
Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them to unto babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither can knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So however it happened, this woman became a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart before the Lord, just as David had spoke about back in Psalm 86. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou will answer me. Somehow hearing the Redeemer was at Simon's house banquet, the woman of notoriously bad character gathered herself together along with what was probably in all likelihood her most prized possession and rushed to the scene. Braving the cruel and scornful eyes, she entered Simon's house and takes up her station at Christ's feet, crying a flood of tears. Possibly, although not mentioned, she also brings with her tear bottles, known among artifacts of ancient Israel. She may have used these smallish sealable bottles to collect her tears from countless nights of weeping over her sins and seamlessly hopeless life. Apparently, altogether, she gathered enough to thoroughly bathe the Savior's feet in the totality of her tears. Not wanting to impose upon the host by asking for a towel, she uses her long hair to wipe up the tears and cleanse the feet of the Lord. It is as if she was repeating after the psalmist. Among the gods, there are none like unto thee, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O God, and shall glorify thy name. Boy, it ties into today's sermon, doesn't it? For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Having cleansed his feet, she begins to kiss them. Uniting her heart with the Lord, this woman's outpouring of love and gratefulness in this passage would almost be embarrassing except that it comes as a tribute of gratitude, affirming her determination to publish her sincere affections for her heart, of her heart, for what Jesus has done for her by saving her out of her sins. She then proceeds to open the alabaster box, pouring out herself with its precious contents, anointing the feet of Jesus. At the sight of this, Simon can hardly contain himself, being scandalized by this scene that has just taken place at his very respectable table. Respectable table. His private thoughts turn to doubt that Jesus was a prophet, because if he were, he would have known what manner of woman this was and never allowed her to touch himself. Such behavior was customary in this time and culture. Now, Jesus knew Simon's thoughts and did answer them with today's parable. 
the creditor and the two debtors. Okay, so let's go through um, the, the, uh, the elements of the parable. We like to kind of use a systematic approach where we line up. Uh, a parable is always a, is a parabolic teaching. It's always a teaching that has a natural, homely message that's familiar. And alongside of that, paralleling that is spiritual uh, meaning to each of those elements that are named in the parable. And so we break it down in this manner. And uh, I really only find about four elements, that natural elements, that need to be discussed here. And uh, the first being the creditor. And of course, that is a portrait of the only good and gracious God. There's a, a debtor of 500 pence in the parable. And that's a person's living a lifestyle of open, gross transgression against God. And uh, this is a portrait, obviously, uh, resembling this woman that we've been speaking of. There's a debtor of uh, 50 pence, and uh, this is a person exhibiting a life that is outwardly respectful, it's respectable, clean, and decent, but still in, transg in transgression against God. And this is a portrait resembling, of course, Simon the Pharisee. And there's the element of uh, forgiveness of debt. Now, forgiveness, of, uh, this is uh, spiritually means, you know, the forgiveness of sins freely offered and accompanying uh, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So in our next part, we like to take a look and summarize the parable and uh, point out the key points into it. So I'll turn to that. Uh, turning to Simon, Jesus drives his point home by asking, Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answers correctly, saying he supposes the one to whom he forgave the most, meaning the creditor, the creditor forgave the most. Um, we have to wonder what thoughts were running through Simon's head. Was he able to con correct, connect the dots? Did he get Jesus' comparisons of himself with the woman? The lack of love that he, in his self-righteous attitude, displayed the Savior? Oh, we were there. Okay. I rather think Simon was not getting it because Christ went on to note the opposition between the behavior of Simon and and this woman. In that culture, it was customary to offer guests water and a towel as they entered the home so they could wash and cleanse their feet. Given that foot travel in open sandals was a necessity in those times, mm -hmm. travelers' feet would get quite hot, dry, and dirty. More well-to-do hosts would have servants to wash the feet of visitors. We would expect someone, someone of Simon's stature to qualify to operate this way. Oil was frequently offered to anoint the head and to refresh dry, cracked feet. And finally, it comes, and finally, it comes with the first greeting. It was customary for the host to give the guest a salutary kiss. Simon did not offer or provide any such amenities. This was tantamount to an insult to Jesus. In deep contrast to Simon, the sinful woman cleansed Jesus' feet and her tears wiped them dry with her hair before in deep humility kissing and oiling them with costly perfumed oil. Jesus goes on to elaborate further. He says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. Jesus is not saying, suggesting that because she loved much, she was forgiven, as some have thought. The word for used here should be understood in the sense of wherefore she loved much. He suggests that she is like the larger debtor in the parable and owed much. And because she was forgiven much, she loved much. Thus, forgiveness is the cause and love is love and overwhelming gratitude is the effect. Contrast this with Simon, who in his own opinion thought his debts were few, and if any, being at least ten times less than this woman's. Therefore he had little or no sense of forgiveness, and consequently, no obligation to Christ. So Simon was like the lesser debtor. 
but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. But this woman went away that day vindicated because Christ says to her in the presence of those who despise her, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Once again, making a striking parallel to Psalm 86. But thou, O Lord, art God, full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous, and mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token of good, that they which hate me may see it, and be ashamed, because thou, Lord, hast helped me and comforted me. To wrap up our lesson, I would like to turn to the early Baptist theologian and Bible commentator, John Gill, for our final application and parting words. So reading from John Gill in his commentary Bible. We shall do well to remember the case of the Pharisee. It is quite possible to have a decent form of religion and yet to know nothing of the gospel of Christ, to treat Christianity with respect and yet to be utterly blind about its cardinal doctrines, to behave with great correctness and propriety at church, and yet hate justification by faith and salvation by grace with deadly hatred. Do we really feel affection towards the Lord Jesus? Can we say, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you? Have we cordially embraced his whole gospel? Are we willing to enter heaven's side? by side with the chief of sinners, and to owe all our hopes to free grace? These are questions we ought to consider. If we cannot answer them satisfactorily, we are in no respect better than Simon the Pharisee. And our Lord might say to us, I have something to tell you. Let us leave this passage with a deep sense of our Lord Jesus Christ's amazing mercy and compassion to the chief of sinners. Let us see in his kindness to this woman of whom we have been reading an encouragement to anyone, however bad they may be, to come to him for pardon and forgiveness. That word of his shall never be broken. Quoting Christ, him that comes unto me, I will no wise cast out. Never, never need anyone despair of salvation if he or she will only come to Christ. Let us ask ourselves, in conclusion, what are we doing for Christ's glory? What kind of lives are we living? What proof are we making of our love to him which has loved us and died for our sins? These are serious questions. If we cannot answer them satisfactorily, we may well doubt whether we are forgiven. The hope of forgiveness which is not accompanied by love in the life, is no hope at all. The man whose sins are really cleansed away always show his ways that he loves the Savior who cleansed them. Let us pray. Great, glorious Heavenly Father, Lord, what an incredible and beautiful and wonderful lesson that you have put for us today, Lord. Uh, let us take us to the heart. Let us apply it to our lives. Let us um, express attitudes of gratitude for everything that Jesus Christ has done to save sinners like us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.